So, good morning, everyone. And my name is Brian Aker. I am a uh, principal engineer at Sun Microsystems. I'm also one of the, uh, well, it's one of the core developers for a database called MySQL. Uh, I've worked on a whole bunch of other stuff, including like Flashdot and um, lots of Apache modules and all kinds of other little things. But what I'm here to talk about today is a project that um, I started about a year, uh, a little more than that, about a year and a half ago, um, which kind of started around a bunch of conversations and, and trends that I noticed. So, assuming this is going to work. Back in about 2005, um, I was director of architecture uh, for MySQL AB, so the corporation that, that existed for MySQL. And at the time, uh, in 2005, we were starting to present the 5.0 uh, roadmap to customers. And CAB is a, what's called a customer advisory board. And so I'd go in and I'd talk to the customers, and you know, there's lots of them there, and I'd explain, well, this is what we've been doing, this is what we've been working on. And at the time, we talked about this is how we've been implementing store procedures, and this is how we've done triggers, and this is how we've done these pieces. And I noticed that in the room, the customers that were in there, the people like the Googles and the Yahoos and all of these, we're all kind of getting fidgety in the, the, in the talk. And I, so I kind of stopped and said, so I'd like to know something about 5.0. How many of you all really use any of these features or really even want any of these features? And about half the room raised their hands. And I made an observation. The half of the room that raised their hands were what we call OEM people. They were folks who needed a database because they were going to replace some other database inside their product, and they just needed it to look and feel like whatever their other database was. They didn't really care about MySQL as something that went for websites or for whatever else. What they did is they cared about it for replacing another database, a commodity component to replace anything. It was the cheapest thing they could find. But the other folks were like, yeah, we don't really care if you had these features, but if they harm performance or anything else, we're really against them. And some of them were even along the lines of like, we really don't want you to have these features at all because we're just going to put if defs in the code and take them out anyway um, because we don't want our developers using that. I mean, one of the most interesting things I learned in recent history when I was talking to some of the Google developers, I was like, well, aren't you guys using this because you're on that? And they go, oh, no, 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 our binaries all have that if deft out. They don't let us use it. So uh, from this, I, I started asking myself, so what are we doing with 5.0, and is this the direction, or more to the point, is there a direction, a set of users that really need us to do something differently? So um, also forward to 2005, I was at OzCon. And at OzCon, um, generally talks on MySQL fill rooms. Very large rooms get filled with talks about MySQL. And I noticed that this was a talk about MySQL's uh, march towards ANSI compliance. And the room had well, pretty much about 20 people in it or so. You know, crickets uh, chirping in the background, really no interesting. Uh, and everyone was staring at their laptops and not really doing anything. And, and, and you know, the, the speaker at the time was going on about, well, we've done this for ANSI compliance and that for ANSI compliance. And at the very end of the talk, he said, do we have any questions? And nobody wanted anything or said anything. So I said, so I got up and I said, so I'd like to ask you all, how many of you all actually care about the ANSI compliance stuff? And one guy raised his hand. And I said, so why do you care about it? And he goes, oh, I work for Oracle. I'm just here for that reason. <laughs> so it got me thinking a lot about, you know, what should we be doing with MySQL? You know, it, it has a certain core audience that need the features that have been added. But there is a core audience also that, frankly, need a different set of features and needed a different evolutionary path than what we were taking. And those users were beginning to become kind of frustrated. Well, why are you doing this stuff? Why don't you increase performance? Why aren't you doing these things that we actually need you to do? So what we did is I sat back inside my notebook and started writing out goals for, like, if we were going to take the project, what would we actually do for the future? And from this, I started working out uh, a new microkernel design for MySQL. So what if we took, did something radical? What if we took what is an existing populated, you know, popular open source project, and at the time, asked ourselves, what have we learned in recent history that would actually allow us to kind of continue in this path of people wanting to use us in new application builds, aka not jump the shark, not you know, allow direction to occur in one area for one set of users, but actually let's take a set of of users and focus on those users and see what we can do for those needs. So there was a number of things that we looked at. For one thing is the storage engine interface was wildly successful. We had lots of people wanting to develop you know, storage engines. You know, Before um, I took the code and made that so that it was pluggable, there was on the planet about 16, maybe 20 engines in existence. It was very hard to do one of these. You know, Within a year after that, there were 70 plus engines that now existed and was growing rapidly. 
So by making the architecture more pluggable, we could extend it so that other people could add features that they needed. Smaller kernel, more features out towards the side, micro kernel. The next thing we looked at is, well, one of the things I observed was is that you know, in 2003 and 2004, we started hiring up everybody from the community. I left Slashdot in about 2003, where I had been doing work on MySQL, but at the same time had another day job and went to working on MySQL full time. And we started bringing in people, but when we did that, we lost the whole concept of actually having outside developers. We, learned, we stopped learning how to interact with outside developers. Um, for projects to actually exist, um, I firmly believe that the difference between somebody who works for you and somebody who doesn't work for you should not matter as far as where code comes from. Code should be valued based on its, inner, you know, its, its value as how well it's written. You know, one set of group of people shouldn't have a faster access necessarily than another. It, we needed to actually go back and say, where, where and when did we lose community involvement, if we even ever had a lot of it, and let's actually find a way to blow the barn doors off. Let's actually bring in a lot, lot more community development. Another goal that we looked at, um, processors. When we originally had written MySQL, it was written in threads. And we could work pretty well on a couple of threads. But the fact is, is that concurrency is growing very, very rapidly. I look at like hardware things, and I see what Intel does, and I have an idea of where Intel's going. But I also look at some of the customized chip, and I see how fast they're growing on a core ratio. One of the things I had to step back and say is, you know, we got to stop thinking about how do we solve the problem of how well do we work on a four core machine. We need to radically look at this problem and ask ourselves, how are we going to work when we're 64 cores, when we're 128 cores? We need to take this approach very, very rapidly because the fact is, is Moore's Law is kicked in in that area, and it's going to outpace us very quickly. So we have to stop thinking about how do we solve today's problems, and we need to figure out how do we solve the problem that is coming in next year and the year after that, because that, that's critical. Next thing I looked at was, what can we actually focus on? Trying to be a database that does everything means that we make a lot of decision points that isn't always good for you know, one, particular, uh, you know, one particular application. You know, focus on web applications. We looked and they said, what is the, the group that is not being served as well right now? Well, the group that's not being served well right now is web applications. We know that the pattern of development there is different than what we see in ERP applications and other business applications. Let's tackle that. You know, let's actually look at that and focus in on that. Yeah, I got asked this morning a question of, hey, what about embedded use? And I said, sure, we're small, somebody's compiled this on the Android, sounds great. It's not what we're interested in. And they go, well, but it'll work there, won't it? And I'm like, yeah, but let me tell you a difference. You know, I made a decision um, fairly recently where we're actually going to get higher concurrency by just basically cloning a simple type of object in the database instead of doing all this referential look through pointers. It's going to cost us 200 bytes. Of, of information, uh, of memory per table object. Uh, but on the other hand, what's it going to do? It's going to raise our concurrency level because we're not going to have to go into this one giant lock all the time to double check things. That's the kind of decision points we're making. How do we focus on, we know we've got a lot of memory and we know we have a lot of cores. Let's go after that problem. The thing also was, is we need to modernize the code base for manageability. When MySQL was first came, when Unireg, which was the predecessor, came to MySQL, we had to ask ourselves, well, at the time, you know, C++ wasn't really entirely viable at that point uh, as a language. There was lots of bugs in it. There was lots of problems, a lot of the libraries around it. You know, we found that that's not the case anymore. Um, we've, been, we've been moving closer and moving faster forward into where Drizzle is not C or C++. Drizzle is actually C++. Um, and as it's become C++, we have found over and over again, for the most part, C++, we can write code in C++ that's just as fast as the code we written it wrote in C if not faster. Things like the STL nowadays are completely usable. Not all parts of it. We have found few corners of it which were not good. But the vast majority of it is actually pretty damn fast and is usable. So things that we thought about over a decade, things that we would have never done, really no longer actually hold. And by you using things like C++ and STL and coming up with pretty common patterns for programming, you know, we have far more open development nowadays because college students can just come in and actually start working on it. They want to learn a lesson. They want to they want to make use of an STL container in a real application. We can actually provide them you know, places to do that in the code. And it's pretty simple because it's the code that they see in their classes. They get it. It's not something that's obscure. So we also had to go back and ask our philosophies. I mean, one of the things we had to sit back and do is, you know, today, drizzle, to, drizzle development, if we look on a per person, we've had more than 100 plus contributors. There's only about six or seven people inside of Sun that actually this is their day job. 
And so we had to say, was, well, how are we going to make sure that we don't do the problem where we forget to communicate with outside people? So like recently, we sat down and said, hey, what are our values? And let's take our values, and then let's publish that values at. So as a team, so that somebody's saying, well, what do the Sun folks who work on Drizzle do compared to the Mixie folks or any of the other team or any of the other company folks? How are, how are, what is our values? What are those values? And so we decided to publish them. And so here were our values, open and well-documented interfaces, transparent goals and processes, fun and courage, remove barriers to contribution, enable contributors to build businesses. The idea was, is let's tell people what our values are and get other groups to share our values. Because we are, while we are central to the project, we are just one set of members to that actual project. There are a lot of other contributors. And we nearly need to, by our own transparency, we're trying to show other people to be transparent. So we got into th thinking about stuff. We had to kind of go things. So what should we start doing with Drizzle? Well, one of the thoughts that came out is let's rethink everything. You know, let's actually ask ourselves every single question of whether something feature was good or not. You know, I was talking to someone out in the hallway and I talked about show process list. Show process list, um, just because it has a command in it, which is the full part where you can get the extended piece of the process list, requires a single binding point in the server for every single query that comes into the server. So no matter how many cores you've got, there's a single binding point in there that has to be passed through. It's the second most used lock. By changing show process list in Drizzle to just have a small subset and remove the ability to see that full query, we actually were able to completely throw out that lock. The binding lock is now gone. Um, if you want to get access to that stuff, we have log files nowadays that we generate. Except that our log files can go to syslog. How do we rethink what we're actually doing? But at the same, not assume everything was bad. Um, and we're also not trying to play catch up. Like I said, we're not looking at eight core problems. We're actually trying to solve problems with many, many cores. You know, how do we do things? We're not interested in the world of how do we work with, you know, 2 to 32 threads to 64 threads. You know, today, and I'll show you later in the slides, we run benchmarks all the way out to 2,048 um, threads. We want to know what it really means to be mass concurrent, and we do this on every single regression run of our system. Um, the world is 64-bit. All of the code that we had in there, it's like, well, if you're a 32-bit system here, we might be able to bypass the memory barrier by doing this and this and this. Scrap that shit. Didn't matter at all. How many people here have deployed 32-bit machines in the last year? Nobody does. All of that code is just more code that takes somebody else who's learning the code. They have to go, well, everything worked like this until this point, but then it works differently if it's signed 32-bit, and then we have to figure it out this if we're doing this. That stuff just complicates the world for people to learn your source base. That's not where we're targeting more. So, and one of the other big things, the web is UTF-8. What is the main storage medium of data at this point incoming? If we're going to be a web da applications database, let's not try to support you know, all these different Windows character sets that are pretty much all dead at this point. Let's actually say, what is incoming data? Incoming data to us comes in two ways. It comes in a byte stream, or it comes as UTF-8. Let's optimize the entire interface from one end to the other to handle UTF-8 data. Let's figure out and remove all the conversion code. Let's actually just make the thing so that we know the incoming data set is what it is, and so let's act on it. Let's not sit around and, and screw around with stuff that hasn't been used in forever. Microkernel design. So, like I said, with a microkernel, what can we do? Well, we can pull out things like the storage engine interface. Um, I did that work, started that work in 4.1. Um, storage engine face. Let's pull replication out. You know, I was at a, visiting a company um, a, a couple weeks ago, and they were very interested, like, we're interested in your replication interface because they have their own replication system built out in their infrastructure. They have their own message bus. All they wanted was a stream from us. Drizzle writes stuff out and uses a library called ProtoBuffers. It's a project from Google. And it basically lets us serialize complex data stores and then send, it out, send them out as messages. We reused Google protobuffers. Why would you do that? Well, because one, it's, there's actually language drivers now out there for every language. You can sit and take our replication stream, and all you got to do is sit there and pick off the messages from it and then execute in your own local language. It's not that you need to have no C or C++ or Java or Perl or Python or whatever. There's wrappers for languages. Use your native languages. Let's make the replication stream something that is so easy to catch and so easy to read that people can do with whatever they want. I mean, I don't know how many times I've walked into companies that have, you know, MySQL bin log saying they're piping to something so that they can grab that data, which then runs this Perl regular expression script that then some monkey eats a banana and makes sure it works here and it files four times a day. No, let's get rid of that stuff. Authentication, protocol, parser, all this stuff. Trying to move the architecture into this environment where 
we're actually pulling apart the pieces into separate components. So things like we can have routing proxies with new protocols. We can do SQL. We can do REST. Uh, you know, we have a group that's working on a, a query memcached dcache that basically pull things apart. Because what we do is the same thing that we found early on when we worked on Apache. By making things modular, it makes it easy for people to extend it. Also on the same token, let's shrink the kernel down. The kernel had gotten really too large. In fact, the old entire code base has. So Drizzle right now is about, when this was done, which was probably a number of months ago, uh, Drizzle was about 315,000 lines of code throughout the entire database. That's it. The kernel today is 113,000 lines of, uh, from the .cc files. I did a WC this morning to take a look at it. NODB itself is about 130. So the kernel is actually smaller nowadays than the NODB code itself is. Let's actually shrink things. It didn't need to be so large. So where are we in all of this? Well, a couple of things. One, we've been working on a new protocol. And if you're interested in talking more about that, uh, Eric Day, if he'll raise his hand, is actually the implementer of it. He lives here in Portland. Um, there's a new protocol. We asked ourselves a number of questions with, you know, with protocol work. Um, one thing, um, we need an asynchronous protocol. Um, you know, I asked myself, why do we have to have a synchronous protocol? Why is it that when I start up a web page, I can't fire off five queries and then just get the data back as I need to get the data back? Why is it I have to go one, step through everything, two, step through everything, three, let's just fire the queries off and get access to them. And that also then on the server, if we can get the asynchronous, if we can get queries asynchronously, we can fire up more threads. We can actually execute across more sets of threads using more cores. So we can get better make use of the machine. So you, you basically, we can actually parallelize your queries just by running them in parallel. Um, another thing, built-in sharding. So I work on, uh, one of the other projects I work on is Memcached D, and I drove uh, one of the, the main C driver for it. Built-in sharding is actually not that hard. Sure, you can make sharding really complicated, but for the most part, Sharding is actually pretty simple, and it's the same pattern again and again. What we did, let's take out the sharding stuff that we built. Memcached D shards pretty well. We, got, you know, we have global clusters on the planet that reach over 10,000 servers. We know how to grow Memcached D. Let's take that same sharding logic we did, and let's take the pieces, and let's stick it back in the database. Because there's really no reason why users today should have to do that. And let's do it in the manner that we learned in Memcached D. What we did is, what we learned, make the, the drivers intelligent. If you make the drivers intelligent, you don't have to build systems that can, you basically make less complicated systems because you don't have to have proxies, you don't have to have, you know, some kind of range server, you don't have to have all of these components in it. Make it smarter in the driver. Make people's lives easier. Throw in UDP. Make the protocol pr uh, pluggable. Allow things so that, like, maybe you actually want an HTTP access. You know, I've watched uh, one of the, the most uh, interesting open source projects I've seen in years is a project called CouchDB. Um, and what was interesting about that was two things uh, that Damien did. One, he used HTTP, and two, he actually picked JSON. It's a great database. It's designed for, you know, for a web interface. That, to me, shows why, you know, basically proprietary protocols to databases, they're very useful, they're very fast, but they're not always the right answer. So that's something we're doing to make things a little bit easier. Um, remove weak attack methods, um, Bobby Tables problem, the, the whole XKCD thing. You know, that's completely lame in the protocol that you just put a semicolon, two queries get executed. Uh, we're now doing enveloping in the new protocol. There's no way to do a SQL injection attack through stupid mechanisms of a semicolon and a couple of concatenation. That is dumb. That should not have existed as long as it has. We're also putting checksums in it because we know that hardware fails. Um, so, in this case, it gives you an idea. Stuff we've looked at. Drizzle, MySQL, REST protocols. We can throw in the Memcached D protocol. We can throw in the Gearbin protocols. Um, this is stuff we're looking at. Storage engines. We had to ask ourselves, what's good about storage engines? Because one of the early questions we got is, well, all this multiple storage engine stuff, Ryan, is kind of complicated. You know, is this actually any good? But when we went around, we found that it actually is good. Lots of people make use of this. Usually they have one, one storage engine, which is almost always InnoDB. And then what they've got usually is one or two tables that are in different engines. Archive my ISM because they have special qualities that are unique that allow them to behave for certain environments very well, but it's not the majority use. So we did decide to retain multiple engine support. What we did, though, is we actually went in and we defaulted the main engine to NODB, though. Why? Because you generally find that most of the MyISAM users out there are people who didn't know better, typed create a table, and then when they found out they had concurrency problems, they were like, what do we do? Or, oh, my data got corrupted. Uh, oh, you're using MyISAM. 
So we actually defaulted it back to an ASCII compliant engine. So we went and moved to the NDB plugin. Um, we also are doing things like allowing engines to own their own metadata. Um, engines are allowed to be much smarter inside of Drizzle. We have removed a lot of the, the bottlenecks around the upper end server to the lower end server and are allowing engines to actually be faster. Um, a lot of MySQL's early design was all based on the fact that MySIM sort of was an engine and also sort of was in the kernel. All of its kernel specifics have almost all been removed. Push those back down the storage engine layer, force the, the upper kernel to do what it should be to do, which is to be an optimizer or a parser, leave storage engines their own work to do. Try not to help them. Other things, logging. Um, trying to read a, uh, you know, the fact that you know, up until uh, 5.1, Turning on and off the general log file required to reboot the server. Ridiculous. But on the same token, it's ridiculous, though, that it even goes to a text file. Why is it that there isn't just a modular point in here? You know, the moment that we wrote the modular point, somebody flipped around in a day and a half and wrote a syslog uh, plug-in for us. Because in their environment, they're logging, they want to go to syslog. At the same time, we remove the concept of a slow query log and a general query log. Instead, what we do is we just have a single API that gives you pre and post API. You can build any kind of logger you want to. If you want to build a logger that does uh, PCRE, well, somebody already did it. Nice one that do, runs regular expressions, can pull out pieces based on regular expressions. Um, this allows us to build query analyzers on the fly. There was a demo uh, Mark Adwood had about three, four months ago of taking, uh, basically taking Drizzle, having all of its log data shoved into Gearman, and then Gearman would sue, set and do math producer operations on it with workers and actually pull out statistical information of these were the bad queries across the cluster, these were queries that actually you know, didn't do well, and just allow people to do things. I mean, key piece, and we, we, you know, Drizzle, the word cloud gets dropped out a lot, and I actually not always happy with that word, to me, it's actually more the word is infrastructure. How do we make a database that can live inside the infrastructure of your environments? How do we make use of your logging and your components? You know, how do we work as a component, not as a standalone system? Because databases are not standalone systems. They are components in a larger architecture. Replication, we put uh, the new API interface to events. So all this stuff uses Google Proto Buffers. So you can just take a stream of Google Proto Buffers and do whatever you want. The first example of a uh, replication uh, implementation was just to take the proto buffers and have a Python driver sit there and spit it out something else. Um, why is it the replication manager can't be written in Python? It's actually not very hard. The replication manager is not very difficult code. Let's just let, if somebody wants to write one in Python, they want to write it in Perl, they want to write it in Java, let's let them do it. Uh, we've got one company already working on a Java one already. And at the same time, let's do multi-database synchronizers as a prototype. There's no reason why. That, that code is simple to write in Python. Next big thing we thought about a lot was the securities. What are the three A's? So the problem is that you know, databases, uh, databases, why do you want your password infrastructure inside your database? Don't you have LDAP servers? Or if you're in an environment where you don't have LDAP servers because you don't actually have security on your database, because there's a lot of places I go to that the default username is root and the password is null. And the reason why is that they are actually are in secured environments where they're not worried about people touching their databases. People touch their databases through web applications. They don't touch their databases by logging into the database. They don't allow that. And for that reason, they don't want any kind of overhead when there's call. Even when you have skip grants enabled, it actually passes through two or three locks even during that process. Let's throw all that stuff away. We don't need those locks in the first place because we're gonna take the authentication system and rip it entirely out to the bone, allow it to exist there, and then let you connect what you ever want to. Um, as an example plugin, we already have one that works through PAM. We actually have one that works through HTTP auth, one of the uh, uh, cloud groups uh, who handles all of their authentication within their cloud infrastructure. Their, their authentication mechanism is HTTP auth. They, when the user connects to the database, they didn't wanna have to dump all their data set into some tables in the database and try to keep that stuff going constantly. They were okay saying, well, during the first connect, we're okay, this needs to be OSH connect, because we're only gonna do it the once when they connect. Fine, let's do HTTP connect. So this whole idea of either, if you don't have an authentication system, it shouldn't cost you a dime. If you do have one, you probably isn't the one in the database. You're probably using something else. Other things, extending SQL through uh, function, via functions. Um, you know, the whole, part of the whole goal is to make a lot of this stuff uh, work such that you can write things in your native languages. So we've started taking the pluggable interfaces and starting to allow people to like create interfaces around it. This is an area that's still a little out there. 
Um, but the idea is, is that any of our interfaces should work the same way Apache works. So you should be able to have a mod Perl. You should be able to have a mod Python. You should be able to have these components that actually wrap it. We shouldn't force you into our particular environment. So a lot of our interfaces we design with the concept that going forward that these will probably have swig wrappers around them. Um, data dictionary and performance interface. Um, one of the things that we started looking at here, and this is actually one of the active projects right now, is when you type something inside the information schema, it shouldn't have to materialize the table and then execute for you. That's too damn slow, the materialization cost. So what we've done is we've started actually, and this is being done by some college students, is that we've taken the IS system and we're placing it back on top of the storage engine system. So it doesn't have its own execution path through the optimizer. Instead, one execution path. One execution path also means what? Less bugs, because there's one way the server is doing it. We can all keep our eyes on one problem. One of the problems with MySQL over time is that we had grown to a problem of having multiple execution paths for many things. It was very hard to manage behavior and, and get consistent behaviors out of these things. Um, so that's some of the stuff we were doing. Uh, and when we came down to performance interfaces, we actually found that the MySQL product development group had came up with this great interface. So we went and took their interfaces, put it up on uh, Launchpad and Blueprints, and that's what we're actually using as our design. Um, not everything that we found in the past was necessarily broken. There was actually some really good design stuff I'd done. Um, one of the big things we wanted to do is we really also wanted to reinforce the concept that um, Drizzle is open source. First thing, internal and external contributors are treated equally. People who are work for Sun or don't work for Sun, it does not matter. What matters is, is the code that you actually write. Second thing, we use the captain system. So, and the captain system is based on your, your tree flows into someone's tree that then it flows up and hits the main tree that then goes through a number of regression suites. Let's actually focus uh, focus, thing, uh, focus code through multiple captains so we get more eyeballs on things. So let's chain people together and make it. We obviously adapted this from the Linux kernel system. All project information is public. There are no internal wiki whatevers inside of Sun um, that exist about Drizzle as far as, you know, well, anything I have access to. Um, we just don't do it. We don't allow it to exist. Every piece of material about Drizzle is on the mailing list or is on uh, inside of the Launchpad Blueprint system. Everything is external. One, the, the moment, and this is something for you all who work on open source, especially inside companies, the moment you move material inside the company is the point at which you harm the actual community. And at the same time, you harm yourself. Because if everyone doesn't, isn't on the same path, the odds of you communicating something incorrectly is very, very high. I've kind of learned in open source that you need to keep everything out there, even if it's embarrassing. We found a regression problem uh, in Drizzle. And we made a mistake for about a week of like going, oh shit, what do we do? And we forgot to mail the mailing list about the whole thing. And then, you know, when we were sitting there a week later figuring out what do we do wrong, one of the things I said, well, we didn't put the stuff in the mailing list, people. The first goal should have been was to take the regression information, stick it on the mailing list. Because there are far more people on the mailing list than there are, were being passed around three or four email addresses. That kind of stuff needs to be public. It's not wrong and there's nothing bad in it. Take that kind of information, make it out there. Um, the other thing was to move to a release early and release often. So we do four-month uh, four uh, uh, milestone cycles. Get stuff in, make it that four month. If it doesn't make it in the four month, that's fine. There's another train coming in another four months. Get stuff completed, get it into the server. Work on stuff in four month period. At the end of the four month period, it certainly was nice to have a, a roadmap that went further, but don't assume at the next, uh, at the next road cycle it will actually work on it. We'll reset then and figure out what we actually need to do. But keep things short. Development cycles of a year to two year to develop software nowadays with no feedback during those development periods is a dead form of development. It, it does not work anymore. Going away and trying to build a product in secret for a couple of years is about the best way for you probably to completely miss the whole point of what you were developing. Release early, release often. Two weekly, and we put out tarballs every two weeks. We keep the tree at a state where that state is always releasable. So every version of Drizzle is a version of Drizzle that goes to the main tree that could be a release. That way, I don't even know when the releases are done anymore. Somebody just picks them up and does them every two weeks. Why is it that they, you know, in the past we would do a, a, this giant shuffle of, you know, someone come back to me or Monty Vadinis and say, okay, so we're going to release this. Is it good? And then we go, uh, we're not sure. And then we'd have to go and do a bunch of checking and a bunch of bug reporting and, a, uh, well, let's run this regression testing. We always know everything is good and we just keep extending our test cases to make it to make it that way. Don't allow any regressions into the tree. Pull them back out if they get there. Um, that's part of the methodology. Uh, adopt open source tools. Uh, we use Launchpad. 
Um, we keep our bugs there. We keep bizarre, we use bizarre there. We use blueprints. All of our information is public. We do distributed regression testing. We have BuildBot. We have Hudson. The idea is everyone should be able to see if something fails. If CentOS stops working, let's know about it. If you've got a FreeBSD machine and you're like, well, we're not support, you know, we, you don't see a FreeBSD machine inside the pool, add your machine to the pool. You know, that's something as far as feedback goes. Give people the ability to say, this is our environment. This is what we're doing. This is the distribution we have. Plug that into our system so that you can know automatically, does Drizzle always build? And we actually watch that stuff. So if we fail on a platform because of some regression piece, we immediately go back in and fix it so that it'll actually run on that. Give us more feedback into your own platforms. Don't make us actually run all this different hardware ourselves. Open source. Um, we went from a translation system that required a custom XML file, which you had to mail in, and then somebody had to like take it up and mark it up and get in the XML file, and then maybe that might eventually end up in the tree. We just use Git text now. Um, Git, Git text has a, a wonderful interface on um, Launchpad for using. In the first three months of Drizzle's existence, we got ported to 30 plus languages, which is more than we ever got MySQL ported to. Um, and that was just in the first three months, just taking in feedback and that. Um, today, moving to all of this, we've had more than 100 plus contributors since the very beginning. Um, we haven't seen numbers like this since probably the early parts of 2000, as far as with the contributions to MySQL. There are more than 500 people uh, on the current mailing list that actually read. A lot of our mailing list is actually real questions of, hey, this is, we're going to remove this feature. What do you all think? And we look for DBAs and other folks to comment that says, yes, you know, you can kill that. Or, oh, God, don't you do that. That is something we use. And then usually when we say, how do you use it? And from that, we figure out, was it being used in a way that made sense? Or did somebody just have a pain point and that by using this piece of duct tape and this piece of gum they found, they actually got it to work? Because if the duct tape and the gum, then what we try to do is we try to actually fix something to work correctly for them. But we try to remove things, but we take a lot of interest. If you walk out of this room and you say, you know, I can't program, so I don't really know that I can contribute, being on that mailing list and saying, yes, I use that feature, or no, I don't, or here's a, here's some, a plugin someone's writing and giving feedback on how those designs work is extremely valuable and is just as valuable as the code that gets written. Because the code that gets written, if it's written in some kind of silo with nobody watching it, it generally turns out to be crap. Innovation happens elsewhere. By opening things up, um, Federated X. Uh, Patrick Galbraith was the original engineer that worked on Federated. He worked on it and then left, and it's kind of left, been left to, to die for a long time. Patrick uh, has uh, went back in and started reworking on that. Um, he does that work under what's called the Federated X engine. But let him actually continue doing development on that and pull that tree in. Just because he doesn't work for us anymore doesn't mean he can't contribute. And so this is development that actually happens elsewhere. Development happens elsewhere in transport. I, I have this still in my slides because when, we, when I originally did this slide, Eric didn't actually work for us. It's fine. It's just Eric started doing all this incredible work, so we went and hired Eric. Um, but the whole thing was is that uh, the transport stuff all began, all the protocol work all began when Eric was elsewhere. Um, other stuff that's done, uh, distributed query cache. This is uh, Toru Masaki. He's a researcher at uh, Mixi JP. Um, he said, well, you know, we actually do need the query cache because we've removed the query cache. The query cache is a giant bottleneck in MySQL, one big lock um, that uh, controls everything. And uh, we had removed it. And Tor came back saying, oh, we actually need this. So he started working on a distributed query cache. And then after that, he said, you know, we have our own storage engine internally. What if we just started making that public to people? So they're working on something called BlitzDB. And BlitzDB is Drizzle with just their st particular storage engine, a thing called Tokyo Cabinet. Allow people to do that. Encourage people to do that. Encourage people to create new distributions. Um, you know, other things come in the sign of this was something that was published this morning. Somebody just popped on the IRC channel and said, hey, by the way, we ported WordPress. I'm like, awesome. <laughs> and so, you know, this was something that came up this morning. Uh, people just start porting stuff. Uh, porting between MySQL and Drizzle is really simple. Um, our SQL is pretty much identical. The only big change is that in create table, uh, you know where it said like int 11 sometimes or int 5? And how many people in the room actually know during a create table what int 11 means? Ex ah, one person. So uh, just for hints, it had to deal with unireg with a teletype terminal and hasn't really worked in probably a decade. Um, why leave that shit in there? Um, people like look at that and go, uh, what does that mean? Because a lot of times people will think that, well, doesn't that control the number of integer numbers? They'll come up with all these kind of secretive, you know, magic things that it must be. 
And the truth is, it's something that's dead and gone. So we remove that. So the biggest problem, if you have to port an application from MySQL to Drizzle at this point, is that your create tables probably have all int paren 11. And I'm pretty sure that somebody at some point will actually publish the Perl script that solves that problem for you. Um, personally, I just open it up in VI and do one big global change and remove it. Um, roadmaps. So our roadmaps are all public. Um, the serious roadmap is the one we completed most recently. Um, this allowed us the new replication events. This went moved to an object-based plugin loader, removal FRM. Uh, we went now to even use proto buffers for what we call the DFEs. Uh, libdrizzle was implemented. Libdrizzle is a BSD implementation of um, our, our driver. In fact, even our server protocol is actually in the driver itself. So if you want to write your own database, you can just pick that up as well. Um, Libdrizzle is BSD. I have gotten sick and tired over the years of trying to explain the GPL to people as far as linking goes. Um, so one of our early goals was it's going to be BSD because I do not want to have to have this conversation any longer. Because it's BSD, conversation goes away. And it's a boring conversation on licensing. It's not about code. Code's interesting. Legalese, licensing, not interesting. Let's not have conversations on it. Um, it actually implements, uh, it, it can talk to both Drizzle, because Drizzle has a new protocol, and it can talk to MySQL. So you can use it for your pretty much any application you want to. And I think it also does SQLite as well. Um, so uh, let's go. We adopted the NODB plugin. We started moving more to C++ and STL code. Aloha is working on right now, working on a new table discovery that's being done by a student. Multi-replicator applier. That's, it's funny, we had had that on our roadmap, but then uh, the person who was working on it hadn't gotten around to it, but now someone in the community has shown up and started working on it. So good going roadmap and encouraged a feature for it to be written. Uh, dependency checking for plugins, new information schema back in, we're refactoring out store lock, that's the main lock that actually uh, destroys performance inside the database. We're also removing the DDL operations from the engine interface and kind of moving them around to make it easier to write storage engines. Uh, my ISAM is going to go away. Um, I've got the patch almost in my tree. It'll be temp table only. Then you're thinking, but we don't want to lose my ISAM. We're going to leave it there if somebody wants to fix it, but it has so many concurrency problems. And by leaving it in the main core as a regular sized engine, we had to keep all this code around just to make sure it didn't destroy itself uh, half the time, which slowed down NRDB, which slowed down the rest of the database. So in what happens, my ISAM gets thrown out. Still there as a temp table. So if you want to use it as a thread local table, you can do that. And if you want to come in and like fix it or write a better massive concurrency in my ISAM, you're welcome to do it. Uh, Bell's the next thing we're working on. Um, some ideas we haven't really looked at. Server-side scripting, there's a blog entry, crow, caro, w.livejournal.com, where I talked about this recently. I don't know if I want to call it stored procedures, because I kind of want to try to re get people to rethink about stored procedures a little differently. Because a lot of times when I say store, stored procedures, somebody thinks PLSQL. Oh, it's stored procedures, so it's PLSQL. So I'm kind of leaning toward the server-side uh, scripting thing, just because I want to encourage Python and Perl and PHP and Ruby and all that. I don't really want to encourage writing yet another language for people. I want a language, I want an adapter point, I want people to be able to write in their languages. I don't want to have to tell people that you have to learn yet a new language. So maybe we may call it server-side scripting. I may skip the SQL standard here and just call it something different to try to get people to think differently. Uh, new work on the performance schema, so you can find analysis going internally. This was a graph recently we did of uh, performance. You can kind of tell, this is, so this is where some of our performance numbers were at the time, 34, 16. We were, uh, you know, those are actually pretty damn good numbers. Um, but on the same token, we're working on getting things a lot better. Um, this is something we found recently. Uh, you'll notice the numbers are a wee bit higher now. This is actually a recent uh, fix we found where basically it was killing TC Malloc. Turns out it was killing us. So by just removing that one piece up there, you can see how much, uh, how fat, how much higher our performance got. Um, we still have problems on the, the 1024, 512 range. I'm not happy with the right-hand side of that, uh, of that table. It's a lot better than what it used to be, but um, I think all of that's going to change in the next couple of weeks. So two, three weeks, I'll push something called the store lock removal. And once that's done, I'm sorry, the, the lock open removal, this graph should go up to, we know there's some problems in ODB above a concurrency of 1024, so we'll probably slam into a wall there. But we are working with those folks to actually get that fix in. But the goal is, let's get this thing going faster. More information. Um, this was an older slide, which is why the, develop, the Drizzle developer day was months ago. Um, we were trying to have uh, developer days, though, with some frequency. You can find more data at uh, launchpad.net uh, uh, Drizzle. That's actually where the project is. Uh, you can also go to launchpad.org, which has all of the nice collection of everything. Uh, you can BZR branch LP Drizzle, uh, get a copy of it. 
Um, if you walk out of here, two things you should know. There's a mailing list. Please subscribe to the mailing list. If you're thinking, if you're sitting here going, hmm, I need a faster database that does all the things that I can easily port to, but I'm concerned they may have deleted X, you should get on the mailing list and ask questions now. And then update the wiki when you get your answers to them. Um, there's also a uh, IRC channel, which is pretty active, can go up to like 70 some odd people with uh, uh, most days. Uh, so you can, pound, you can find pound drizzle. Uh, lots of com communication going back and forth there on what's being developed and what's happening. Um, there's lots of things that can be done. If you're, if you are saying, hey, I don't know C, C++, there are so many things that can be done by outside people. Go to the mailing list. Uh, you can contribute by helping write the new documentation set. You can plug a new machine that we don't have already into BuildBot or Hudson. You can, uh, you know, you can uh, help. We, we've got open schemas nowadays for data on a regression. Build us a PHP page that, that shows pretty graphs for what we've got doing. You know, port other applications. There's lots of stuff that can be done. So there's plenty of ways to get involved. And I think on that note, I am both out of slides and I'm out of time. So any questions? Yes. So for the last two or three months, they've had a um, PR person like travel around with me so that I won't open my mouth and say anything, but they missed this conference. <laughs> but I'm going to channel that person's presence anyway, because the, the truth of the matter is that I don't know anything, and anything I would say would be conjecture. Well, and then somebody puts it in the press, I'm and I, I'm screwed. I, Drizzle right now has 100 plus contributors, seven work inside of Drizzle. I am pretty sure that Drizzle is going to continue to do whatever in its own method uh, going forward. So I'm not, I, you know, one of, the, one of the things was is to not make this so centric on, e. there's a great interest in Sun because there's a lot of good stuff that could be done with Sun as far as Drizzle. Drizzle makes sense from a business standpoint. But on the same point from a development standpoint, I don't really think you can, uh, I think the day and age of like uh, trying to develop everything in-house is kind of a, a crummy method of development. You get more eyes, more people. So the whole idea was to buy in. In the process of that, more people will put more work into it. The query cache is being entirely done at Mixi. They're the folks who run that part of the project. I have no, I, I throw some thoughts at them when they come up with some thoughts. Same thing goes with BlitzDB. So. Uh, yes. Uh, really quickly, uh, do, uh, yeah. Oh, let's see where checksums come up. Uh, checksums to write to disk, checksums in the network protocol. You should be enable or disable those things. Um, you know, TCP IP, reliable, meh, kind of. Uh, you run high enough, uh, high enough uh, sites and run enough of it, you'll find that uh, it's not quite as 100% robust as people think it is. So that's the idea, so that you can turn on checksumming if you want to. So. I've never found an efficient way of actually check something memory on machines. Uh, usually, that usually the corruption is so apparent so quickly that everything like you know blows up that it hasn't been much of an issue. But something to think about. I haven't really given much of a thought to it though. Yeah. Um, how many people or is anyone running Drizzle? So I get asked this question. I doubt that there's even 10,000 Drizzle servers in production today. But here's the real answer: is you shouldn't be running Drizzle in production today. I do not think that's a very good idea. Um, you know, and people will corner me on this, and they go, well, we don't use this, and we don't use this, but we tried putting it in here, and it worked a lot better for us, and we know this is where we want to go, so can we start using it now? And I'm like, well, you know all the caveats of everything right now. I mean, we, I, I fixed the, uh, in December, I fixed the, the dump program to make sure it would work because I got tired of the, every other week somebody showing up saying, oh, by the way, I installed Drizzle, it's been running now, but we don't know how to upgrade, and it turns out dump doesn't work, so, Shit, <laughs> how do I get my data back out? You know, some guy had like a couple hundred servers, and I'm like, you have a couple hundred servers? What the hell were you thinking? <laughs> yeah, anyway, um, you know, I, so we fixed dump to make sure dump always works. Uh, I don't really suggest it. Um, I really don't think we're at that point of where people should be using us in production. Um, if you're going to do it, I would suggest you read the mailing list and you 
probably hire a developer, but I, we're still a ways off. Um, I target right now, I think we'll probably be, my original target date for production was, uh, I, it's kind of, it's been based a little bit based on feedback. Like, when do people care? When can we roll certain things out? Like, if you don't want replication today, that's like something you're not caring about, or you can, then fine. You probably can use this just fine, and you're going to be, it's awesome. So if you've got a bunch of, you know, databases, and you're using memcached with no replication, you're pretty much in good shape. Um, if, for instance, you need replication streams, you should wait until the fall um, to do this. But really, I think about, I'm kind of hoping like June of next year is when like I can say that it's actually a rock solid GA. Um, but I'm not trying to rush to get to that point, because if I rush to get to that point, we're just going to end up doing a bunch of shit half-assed. So the point's not to rush. Um, and you know, all along, we pick up people all along. So. Yes? So, uh Uh, it is changing at the moment. So the old storage engine interface I never found to be all that difficult, but there was some wankiness dealing with DDL implement against basically scrolling, you know, doing selects, inserts, updates. We're fixing all of that to be uh, less weird. Uh, and that's the work that's going into the tree right now. So I would probably wait a couple of weeks or get on the mailing list and ask questions to Stuart Smith, he's an Australian, uh, about some of the changes he's making. But it's really not that hard to write storage engines. And uh, because of the nature of the changes to the interface, I'm actually finding it's easier and easier to do. So, uh, other questions? Well, yes. Um, you mentioned the replication interface. Yeah. And I understand you're making that pluggable. Yep. Is there someone working on the default plugin? And is that still, are you still taking feedback for that? That is the area that we're actually taking very active feedback in right now. In fact, there's a, a commit that just came through that has a bunch of new uh, test cases for it. So that, if you're interested in that, that is something you should be asking about on the mailing list right now because um, the, the, proto design, uh, the proto design is looking pretty stable as far as the way the message format is. But I would love, like if somebody, like uh, I visited a customer three weeks ago who was looking at the implementation of it uh, and said, by the way, did you think about this? We need this. And it's like, dope. Went back, added that to the, the interface. So that was something that needed to be added to the replication piece. Um, Right now, we're more focused on making sure the message format is good. We have a default one that just streams it out to disk so it can be read to disk. And I think it's on Eric's task to do one that'll send it to Gearman sometime in the next, in the next in the, probably in the next couple months. So we'll be able to send the, the, the replication protocol to Gearman, and then you can just build Gearman workers to do replication however you want to. But if you're interested in that, that is something that you should definitely be involved with today and definitely be looking at the proto design because there's a lot of thought going into that right now. And are there any other questions? And on that note, I thank you for much time, and I hope this was useful for you. <laughs>